morning, everybody. Welcome this morning. Good morning out there in Facebook land, and um, we welcome you to join us this morning as we get into God's word and just listen to what he has for us this morning. And um, we, we want to also thank, just thank God, thank our gracious Father just for um, everything that he gives us, even good, even if we're going through something bad, um, something um, just fearful, something uncertain. He is with us all the time. And so let's thank him this morning. Let's invite him in, into our hearts, into our minds, um, as we uh, sing worship and as we get ready for Pastor Mark and, and his sermon. Let's go ahead and pray. Oh, dear gracious Father, we do thank you. We thank you for just every blessing you give us. We thank you for every trial you give us because we know that when you do that or when that does happen, Lord, that you are there for us and that we grow from this, Lord Jesus, and we just get closer to you um, in our relationship. And that is that just glorifies you and that is what you yearn for from us, Lord. So today, this morning, as we just kind of ask you to quiet our hearts and our minds, Lord Jesus, that we are listening and we are hearing um, what these songs are saying to us and what our sermon is saying to us as Pastor Mark delivers it, Lord Jesus. I just ask that you bless the worship team this morning and um, that we can just feel you here with us, Lord. In your son's name, amen. Thank you for all that you do for us, God. It's a 
Is God's grace enough for you today? It's a wonderful grace that he has for us. We're going to do an old song and pep it up a little bit. grace of Jesus. It's always there for us. I had kind of a hard week and I was looking for a little bit of sympathy and God had me look at the news. So what's happening down in Texas? What's happening in Mississippi? He said, you really want to feel sorry for yourself? <laughs> Lord, we pray for the people that are going through that, that terrible time down there through the, because of the storm. Texas and Mississippi and on the East Coast and even even all over the U.S., Lord, everyone is being affected by the fact that vaccines cannot be delivered and, and 
water shortages. We just pray, Father, that your grace will be enough for them, that you'll keep them safe, that you'll break down the barriers, the things that are keeping food and supplies away, and that you'll just open up a door. We call upon your name, Father, because there's power. Power in your name, Jesus. time when we just encourage you if you have a need have a concern or even have a praise you want to make to come to the altar to meet Jesus there and to experience his power in your life so I uh, will stay standing during this next song if you want to come down and pray at the altar we encourage you to do so Where are you? 
have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause. Because I just feel like a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned your way and walked away. I would have labeled me beyond repair. Because I feel like I'm beyond repair. But somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who saves. You're the God who saves. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who thought I had to earn my way, but I'm learning you don't work that way, because somehow you don't see me like I do, somehow you're still here, you're the God who stays, you're the God who stays, you're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done to separate my heart from the God who stands. Oh, my shame, my shame. separate my heart from the God who Well, good morning. Good to see you all, and good to see you all through the camera. So we're finishing up our uh, little walk through the book of Nehemiah this morning. This is not a very big book, but I think we spent about six weeks looking at uh, various things that happened as 
Nehemiah uh, first is caught up with the physical distress of his hometown, Jerusalem, and then as he moves in and starts taking care of some of the physical problems, he finds that, whoa, there's a, there's a lot of uh, spiritual and emotional and, and relational social things that need to be worked on as well. And so we've seen the, the restoration of the walls, but also the restoration of the people. And so we've talked about rebuilding God's people with a kind of an eye on the fact that as we emerge from, from COVID, uh, in some ways we will be um, a different facility, a different group of people simply because of what's happened to us. And we can use that as opportunities and leverage to uh, become more effective as we serve um, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, some evenings, not all the time, not even often, but some evenings as I'm getting ready for bed, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, you know, what's really the point? Um, I, I worked hard today and I came home tired and all I did was sit around. I'm just surviving so I can go back and work hard again tomorrow. And uh, one of the ways to talk about that syndrome, if it seems like all I do is to work hard so the next day I can work hard again, is called the rat race uh, because it's like our little, it's actually a gerbil friend, I, I know, but our little rat friend that gets there on the exercise wheel and you're working hard and you're exercising, but when you get off that wheel, you're exactly where you got on it. You're just a lot more tired. And sometimes I think, uh, all of us kind of go through that thing of saying, you know, boy, I'm working hard, but is anything really changing? Am I, am I different? Are the people around me different? Has it made any kind of impact in the world? And uh, we're going to look at Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah, when we get to the end, there's going to be some great promise. But along the way, uh, this chapter brings out for us three warnings, three warnings of dead ends. Three warnings of dead ends of directions that we go to try to make a difference that, that really don't get us anywhere. And so let's start with Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 4. And it goes something like this. Nehemiah 13, 4. Uh, before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge in the storerooms in the house of our God, in the temple or the church building. And he was closely associated with Tobiah, an Ammonite, and had provided Tobiah with a large room that had formerly been used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, the new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked permission and came back to Jerusalem, and here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. Household goods, you could take one of the O's out of goods and be pretty accurate. A lot of the household goods are, were also household gods um, when that phrase is used in the Old Testament. And so I gave orders then to purify all the rooms. I put back into them the equipment of the house of God, the grain offerings and the incense. And then I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. And so I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? And so I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and the Levite named uh, Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zakur, the son of Mathentiah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember this, remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have done faithfully for the work of the house of my God and its services. 
So here's the dead end, and I'm calling these wrong measuring sticks. As we try to measure what makes life worthwhile, we sometimes, we oftentimes use the wrong measuring stick to measure the value and the impact and the quality of our life. And one of the ways that we do that, and this is the hardest one to take because I like friendship, and friendship is very important, and in the church we promote friendships, but we can make friendships more important than our loyalty to God. And that's what happens in this story. It's it's a political alliance between uh, the high priest and this uh, leader of the Ammonites. But the Ammonites were sworn enemies to Israel. They were um, very. Uh, they were one of the the groups that practiced uh, child sacrifice. So their wor- their sense of what worship was was really uh, perverted. Just to be honest, um, and this. Tobiah is one of the guys who had ferociously fought Nehemiah at every step of trying to rebuild the wall. But somehow they were good political allies. They, they helped each other out. And it says that Tobiah had become a good friend of the high priest. And that friendship, which is not a horrible thing at all, but the friendship made Eliashib forget. It made him forget that his number one responsibility was to ensure vibrant worship services when they had their their Sabbath worship experiences. That friendship with Tobias said, and Tobias said, you know, I just need a little bit more room to do my business. You know, the, the little room that I have that's two or three blocks away from the temple, it, I've got a lot more business and I'm not doing it very well. You know, couldn't you find me somewhere else? And Elias just said, well, I know just the room for you. Um, it's, it's the warehouse in the temple. Um, it says uh, courtrooms, and they were. They were rooms in the courts of the Lord. But it was a room about as big as our whole top floor of our building. So we're talking about a big room. And Elisha said, you know, it's not that really important. I mean, people don't actually worship there. Um, so why don't you just kind of move in there, and we'll move some of that stuff out, and you'll be just fine. And so that's what happens. Of course, what Elisha didn't say because he kind of forgot is that was the room when when the Israelites would come and when the, the Jews would come and they'd worship and they'd bring their their tithes and offerings. And tithes and offerings weren't checks. Uh, that I don't even know if they had checks back then. Um, certainly wasn't debit cards or online. But when they brought tithes and offerings, it was a, a tenth of the the grain, the wheat that they harvested that week. It was uh, a tenth of the, the wine that they had uh, developed that week. It was a, a, a tenth of the olive oil that they had pressed that week. And so you brought all this physical stuff in, and that was how people paid their tithes. And then the way that the Levites, who led the worship service, their source of income was those, uh, the grain, the olive oil and the wine that was brought in from people's tithes and offering, then that became the sense of support for the priests. So now you think about this, okay, so it's a nice system. The people who worship bring food in as their offering, and the people who lead the worship um, are spending all the time leading for worship so they can't have their own farm and take care of themselves, but they can go to the temple and they can receive the food from the worshipers. And so everyone's taken care of. Well, the place where all that happened, the transaction happened in this room that's now given to Tobiah, this foreign official. And pretty soon, Eliashib has to say, you know, we don't really need so much in the ways of tithes and offering because we don't have a place to put it. So you can imagine, all of a sudden, you're, you're a good Jew, and you show up one Saturday, and you're ready to give your tithe, and the high priest says, you know, we don't really need your olive oil today. Not any room to put it. And you think, well, wow, this is a good deal. I've, all of a sudden, I've got 10% more olive oil this week. Um, I can handle that. And so you quickly develop, maybe I go to church, and maybe I don't, but when I do, I don't take a tithe. Well, what's the real problem about this is those poor priests, all of a sudden, they go to that storeroom, and it's no longer a storeroom that has olive oil to keep them 
um, olive oil and grain and all the other things to keep them from starvation. That we, there isn't anything there besides the business offices of Tobiah Esquire. So what do you do? Well, either you starve or you go back to your ancestral home 8, 10, 12 miles away and you start doing subsistence farming at your own place. And of course, if you're doing subsistence farming at your own place, you're not in church on Sunday morning or Saturday afternoon. And so the whole system of people's tithes and worship providing for the worship leaders that provide leadership all that falls apart because Eliashib forgot to protect worship. The quality of worship and discipleship drop, dropped off, and, and you find later on in the story, which, which we also read, you know, that it wasn't just that um, that room was being used for the wrong purposes, and apparently inside the, the temple precincts there were foreign gods, the household goods of of someone that worshiped other kinds of gods, but the whole ability to provide worship service, which is the number one responsibility of Elisha, has been laid to the side. And so sometimes, um, if everything is measured by friendship and that's all that counts, uh, we forget some of the more significant things about our spiritual connection and our spiritual loyalty to the Lord. Well, the next story continues this forgetting theme. That's how um, our commitment to money sometimes can um, make us forget the God-given gift of rest. And so in Nehemiah 13, verse 23. Moreover, in those days, I saw the men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moabite, uh, the briefest thing to say about those is all those practiced child sacrifice. Um, half of the children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and didn't even know how to speak the language of Judah. So they had no way of accessing God's word. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. Don't recommend that. Um, I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you're not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take the daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that even Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among all the nations, there was no king like Solomon. He was loved by God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we now hear that you two are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Joida, son of Elishab, the high priest, was also son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite, and so I drove him away from you. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priests of the Levites. Yeah, I think I went, read just a little bit further than what I wanted to. Um, oh, yeah. Well, let's, let's go back to uh, verse 14. I, I got ahead of myself. Verse 14, uh, remember me, my God. Verse 15, in those days I saw the people um, treading wine presses on the Sabbath. So we're talking about the Sabbath. And bringing in grain and loading on donkeys together with the wine, grapes, and figs and all the other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre that lived in Jerusalem were also bringing in fish and kinds of merchandise and selling them on Sabbath to the people of Judah. And so I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you're doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestor do the same thing? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. And so when the evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut, and not to be opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. And once or twice, the merchants 
and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. And so I warned them and said, why do you spend all night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. So from that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and to go out and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this, remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy according to your great love. So this is the Jewish commandment, the Old Testament commandment, the, one of the Ten Commandments, to keep the Sabbath day holy. And Israel, especially Judah, Jerusalem, is very much dependent on international commerce. Uh, like any big city, um, it can't support all of its own needs, and so it engages in commerce both um, with other cities in its own nation, but also international commerce. And, of course, the foreign traders, um, I mentioned people from Tyre, uh, they didn't really understand the Sabbath, and so they just ignored it. Here's some of the understanding. Every system needs a time for rest. Every system needs a time of rest. Um, our bodies need rest. It, at least every night uh, we get sleep. Um, our, our families need times of rest. When the family just kind of uh, locks out the outside world for a day or so or for a vacation and we kind of re-knit with our family. Cities need days of rest. And one of the interesting things about when COVID first hit was um, all the wonderful pictures that were shown, you know, when, when the city has to shut down for a little bit, all of a sudden the air gets clean. And some other things, that positive things that happen, <laughs> a lot of stress, but some positive things as well. Um, if the people of Jerusalem were going to get rest, the commerce had to take a day off. And that's what God had declared was that on Saturday, no commerce was to be transacted. And that allowed every person that lived in Jerusalem not to be worried about business affairs, but instead to take care of their family and take care of their worship. And this allowed their body to recuperate and be ready to go full steam on the next day. It was God's plan. And the plan is a little bit further than that. It's not just, uh, I know how your body works and you need one day and seven off, but it was also a promise from God which was, if you work seven days, I'm going to take care of the seventh. Or another way of saying it, among my people, six days' work gives you seven days of wealth. Just to put it as uh, bluntly as we can, it's a promise from God. You work six days and give me one, I'll make sure that you have all of the abundance, all the provision, all the protection. And so as long as Israel practiced that, God made sure that they were always safe and protected from their enemies on the Sabbath day. You'd think it wouldn't take very long for the enemies to find out, hey, these people aren't doing anything on Sabbath. That's the day to attack them. God always kept them safe. He protected them. And as long as they practiced Sabbath, God made sure that it didn't affect their standard of living negatively. In fact, if anything, it affected it positively. Positively. Foreign traders, of course, they didn't understand that. They just thought, you know, how can you give up the seventh day? It took us six days to get here from Tyre with all the stuff. Now you're going to tell us we have to wait another day before we come in? And so they came in and they conducted business, and it didn't take very long for the people of Jerusalem to say, well, there's people here with all sorts of neat stuff, and they're willing to give us a slight discount on Saturday, so let's go ahead and get involved. And so... Um, their measuring stick of money made them forget that God had promised to protect them. God had promised to give them rest. That rest was not a horrible negative thing. You can't do something, but rest was the promise that on the Sabbath day, I'm going to take care of you. If you trust in me, I will protect and provide. And so they became involved in that rat race of always working harder and finding out that no matter how much they, they did business, even on Saturday, somehow they weren't getting ahead the way they thought. And in our human brain, we think, if I'm not getting ahead by working seven days, then I need to work seven days times 10 hours a day. 
or times 12 hours a day. It just gets worse and worse. And God is so wonderful to say, no, no, no. Take the seventh day off. Trust me and find out what I can do for you. And so then I've also read the next passage already. Um, uh, how, how convenience became the measuring stick. It's the, the men that were marrying women from Ashdod and from Ammon and from Moabite. And those names don't mean anything to you. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to show you a picture of what child sacrifice looked for just to make sure that you have a graphic image and, and it really drives home. And it wasn't the only thing that was uh, sinful or perverse or just kind of gag-inducing about these um, other ancient nations. But there was a lot. Um, but certainly kind of at the top of it was um, most of the surrounding nations had these big fire pits into which you sacrificed your firstborn child. And yet, um, it says that the people of Jerusalem were marrying these uh, women and some of the women were marrying the men, but it's more the men marrying the women. And here's the problem. And it was a problem. This is a problem of convenience. The problem was is that um, there's the, the records of the people who came from Babylon, when Babylon said, you can go back to Jerusalem. Um, all you people in Babylon, you can go back to Jerusalem. Most of the people that made that trip were men. And so you get back to Jerusalem and you find that for uh, every eligible uh, woman, uh, there's three or four eligible men, and the numbers don't add up. And so when a man gets ready to marry, he looks around and he thinks, wow, um, all the other women my age have already been snatched up by the quicker men, and I'm here, I need a wife, I need to start a family, and there aren't any good Jewish girls to get married to, so I'll just do the easy thing. I'll just find a, a girl from a local nation uh, that's nearby, that's five or ten miles away. Um, you know, I'll ask her if she wants to be my wife, and she says yes, and we'll have kids. You know, well, I have to sacrifice the first one to Moloch, um, but after that, hopefully she's really fertile, and we can have lots more kids, and that'll make up for it. Um, what they should have done, what they should have done was said, you know, God has a plan for us, and my plan, God's plan is that Jews marry Jews. If there aren't Jews here, I know where there are some. And I'm going to take the month, and I'm going to go back to Babylon. I'm going to find a, a good Jewish girl there, and I'm going to tell her I have a nice home back in Jerusalem. We're going to get married in Babylon, and we're going to travel together back to her home and set things up. But that was inconvenient. It would take a couple of months to take some work. Um, Take, making the arrangements, that was inconvenient. The easy thing to do was to say, there's people right here. They're good people, and um, they'll, they'll, be, they'll work hard. They'll take care of the house. They keep, make me good meals, make me lots of babies. Everything's good. Of course, it wasn't good. The convenience meant that they forgot to protect their children. The, the very obvious thing is you're not protecting your children if you get involved in a system where you have to give up the first child to uh, child sacrifice. But more than that is it meant that now their children would be taught the real values, and especially spiritual values, by, by women who were committed to other gods. And there were lots of things that were different about those other gods. Uh, they, they weren't just like Judah except for one or two things. They were different in every regard. The children would now be taught other religions. Um, at best, at, at worst, the children would just become totally absorbed into the um, religion of Ashdod or Ammon or Moab. At worst, at, at best, they'd have this kind of mishmash. You know, a little bit of Judaism, a little bit of this other religion, and we call that syncretism, which is a uh, um, a, a major danger for the church today in America. It's really easy for us to take, you know, two-thirds of what it means to be a Christian and then one-third of what all the people are doing around us and think that we can mix it together so that um, 
that, that God is no longer our absolute standard. He's just a menu option, you know, that you can go and you can choose. And there's some of these things on the menu that belong to Christianity. And there's some things that belong to being, uh, making money your goal. And there's other things that go along to say, you know, this is uh, what it means to be, to do things the convenient or to the sensual way. And we just pick and choose out of those menus. And sometimes we choose from the God menu. Uh, syncretism. Um, and God, of course, is saying, I want to be everything. I want to be the only measuring stick of how you define what's good and wrong, uh, how you define who you are, and how you define the steps that you'll take into your future. Um, we don't marry women from Ashdod. At least none of you have come to me ask if you could marry uh, an Ashdodite or a Moabitess. Um, I think sometimes, though, we, we marry our love for Jesus along with Netflix. It, it's surprising how often that, that movies that we watch portray what we know is sin and they portray it in a positive way. And let, let me just say briefly that just because a filmmaker can make something look attractive in 35 minutes on a TV screen doesn't mean it's attractive. And certainly it's not a measuring stick for whether it's good or not. But we get sucked into that sometimes. Pop psychology. We're placing God help with self-help. Uh, pop psychology and Netflix, they're not evil. But we can, over time, begin to be more absorbed into non-Christian, non-biblical ways of looking than the measuring stick that God has given to us. So let's look finally then at the positive picture, which is all the way back at the beginning of the chapter, uh, the measuring stick of God's word in Nehemiah 13, verse 1. On that day, we don't know which day, it's before all the other things happened. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud. And so this is the second time it talks about this um, thing that Nehemiah instituted where on occasion, everyone in the town would gather together at the town square, and someone would read the book of Moses aloud. They'd read their Bible. Read the book of Moses aloud in the hearing of the people. And there it was found that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. Uh, because they had not met the Israelites with food or water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Parentheses, well, our, our God, however turned that curse into a blessing. But when the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Now we can talk about who the Moabites were and the Ammonites and, and why they were excluded, but wh wh what I want to say is that these people, they gathered together, big group of believers, they heard God's law, and when they heard it, they heard, oh, we're not supposed to have Ammonites or Moabites as part of our, of our group. Um, there's several options when you hear that, that uh, what the Bible says, that what you are already doing is the wrong thing to do. There's several responses you can have. You can't say, well, our friends don't do it that way, and they seem to be getting along just fine. Or... Um, Often, often I hear this in the church, you know, I know that's what the Bible says, but we can't really afford to do it that way. Uh, we can't financially afford or relationally afford, we, or we don't have the time. One way or the other, we can't afford to do it God's way, so we're going to do it our way instead. Or sometimes it's just not practical. You know, that, that's a nice idea, and it's nice theology. It's in the Bible. It sounds so pretty, what Jesus says, but it's really not practical. But these people said, wait a minute. No, that, that's not a hard way. It's not an expensive way. It's not an impractical way. This is the way. This is the way. God says it, and so we're going to do it. This is the way. This is the way to life. This is the way to walk with Jesus. This is the way to be the people of God. And that's 
um, that's the little secret that's tucked in to this last kind of throwaway chapter because it's after all the big stuff that's happened in Nehemiah. And these four verses to say, you know, they heard it was a hard thing, harder for them than we can imagine, but they heard it was a hard thing. And rather than finding some way why this way is the wrong way, they simply said, this is the way. And we're going to do it. And they did it, and God blessed them. It's interesting, as I read through the commentaries and what life would have been like at this time, one of the commentaries had this to say, a very negative description of Israel, or of Ju uh, Jerusalem. It said that Jerusalem had settled down into a comfortable compromise with the Gentile world. These were to be God's special people who showed how being God's special people gives you special blessings that no one else can get. And instead of being God's special people getting God's special blessings, they became people just like everyone else that got no blessings. Because when God is our measuring stick, stick when God is the measuring stick, he also becomes our provider and protector. Those two are connected. Those two are connected. If God's no longer the measuring stick, then we've moved from God being our measuring stick, but we've also moved from being in the place and in the position and in the faith condition where God can protect us and provide us. The further we move away from that measuring stick, the further we move from God being able to protect and to provide. You know, the, the great New Testament verse on this is Matthew 6, 33. But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And you can look at the flow of the conversation Jesus has had before that. When he talks about all these things, he means specifically protection and provision. You're worried about not having enough food. You're worried about not having a security, a sense of the future. He said, hey, if you just make me first, make me the measuring stick, make me the center of your life, Make me the thing that counts and everything else is measured against. If you do that, I'm going to take care of all that for you. It's the, the faith-trust relationship that we have with God. Well, one last verse in Nehemiah, the, the very last verse, and um, it gets us back to, to Nehemiah's personal history. Um, Nehemiah 13.31. So I made provisions for the contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits, once again taking care of the, the, uh, the priests. And then he has this little prayer that he ends this journaling with, his, his diary. This little prayer. Remember me with favor, my God. Remember me with favor, the the, the my God is where he's saying, God, you're the measuring stick. I don't measure whether something's important to do on the basis of how much money it makes or how easy it is or how it gets me, allows me to get along with other people. I measure on the basis of who you are. And who you are is God. You have the right to decide what's right and wrong and where you want me to be and where you tell me not to be. You have that right. And I want to continually, when I hear what your word says, I'm simply going to say that is the way. This is the way. My God, remember me. Um, not challenging God's memory, but saying continue to think about me. I want to be aware. I want to have a confidence that God is continually thinking about me. And as I pray for each one of you, that's often the prayer, you know, would today... Uh, would my friends, would they know that you are thinking about them, that you are providing for them, that you care for them, that you are there with them? And the word favor sounds like God saying, oh, you're a great guy. You know, you've got my favor. Uh, what favor actually means is that God provides for your practical needs. Um, favor, more than anything else, the easiest translated would be finances. Uh, remember me with enough finances to get by. And so here, here's his prayer. He said, God, I, I've done everything I could do. I've tried to make sure that not only in my life, but in the life of the people I'm responsible to, that we're all making you the one and only measuring stick. You're the standard of what's good and wrong, 
of what's uh, important and what's unimportant. You're, you're it. You're all. We haven't married you to something else. We've just got you and you alone. And so don't forget to be moving into my life with all the things that I need. I've made the kingdom of God. I've sought it first. And so now provide for me all these things. And so the question is, did God honor that prayer of Nehemiah at the end? Did God remember Nehemiah? Did he provide for him? Did he make Nehemiah something more than just another guy that gets on the, the rat wheel and runs it hard and then gets off at the end of the day? And Nehemiah worked awful hard. He can look at this and uh, if you think it's easy to try to pull out someone else's hair, you know that this guy is a hard-working guy. And all the other things he did as well. Building a, a wall at the same time as holding his hammer in one hand and his uh, sword in the other hand. Here's a hard-working guy. But at the end, he says, you know, all, all it's about, really, is that I wanted to make you my measuring stick and that in return, I'd have the confidence that you were remembering me. Did it pay off for Nehemiah? Well, here's an interesting thing about Nehemiah. Then let you judge about whether God honored the prayer. Um, if you were to look at some of the, at the key components of what Judaism is today, in February 2021, the key components of what Judaism is all about, it'd probably be the, those three things that Nehemiah instituted in this book. Nehemiah changes Judaism. Ne Nehemiah and Ezra working together. Um, Nehemiah changed Judaism from being a place where worship meant something that you watched the priests do, the sacrifice and animals, to worship meant that you stood outside and you heard God's word, and when you heard God's word, you went and you did it. It's a huge change. They became not the people of the temple, although they still had a temple, but their central identity from this point on becomes their people that listen to and understand and obey the word. That was something that Nehemiah did that's still one of the primary characteristics of Judaism today. Nehemiah was big on taking the Sabbath day off. And it's such a big thing that although most of the time the press that I watch doesn't tell me much about what's going on in the religious world, it did report that Last month, one of the senators in our U.S. Senate said, you know, I know we have important work, but can we take the Sabbath day off? Can we take the Sabbath day off? Nehemiah maybe is still having an impact. It says that we read in this passage two different times that Nehemiah was big on saying, now God's standard says you don't marry outside the faith. That Jews just marry Jews. Now, and that is still, still one of the major components of what it means to be Jewish. Not every Jewish person does it any more than they did then, but here's something about Nehemiah's influence in saying, you know, we've got to maintain our purity as the people of God, as the people of the Bible, of the people who've gathered together and called according to his name. And part of that means we're very careful about who we marry. Apparently, Nehemiah's impact has been influential enough so that uh, today, there are almost 15 million Jews around the world. And that's only happened because of Jews marrying Jews. So I would say Nehemiah was incredibly effective. Nehemiah shaped some of the major dimensions of one of the world's most influential groups of people. 2,400 years later. So I would say, as we close, I would say, you know, I'm just challenging you to make a 2,400-year impact with the way you commit yourself, the way that you live. Making a measuring stick out of God and God alone and being very careful not to go down um, the dead ends of other kinds of things that become ways in which we measure or evaluate ourselves and measure or evaluate others. Not just a 24-year, 2,400-year impact, an eternal impact, right? We're in this for eternity. Our church can make a 2,400-year impact or an eternal impact 
We, we can experience God's protection and provision today. And as we continue to make God's word and God's truth the center and the core, the way in which we evaluate things, we can experience God's protection and provision for today and know that we are building God's favor in the lives of other people forever. Now, thank you for sticking with me as we've gone through Nehemiah and uh, just the challenge to say, let's continue to make a God and his truth um, the center of how we judge and evaluate both ourselves and those around us. We can do it with grace, but we need to do it with consistency. Let's pray. God, um, when we first read the words in Nehemiah 13, so many strange things and strange names and places and problems that people had, the more we get thinking about it, we go, yeah, I think a lot of times I just judged whether I should do something on what was the easiest thing to do. Uh, so many times maybe I have to admit, you know, the, the pressure of the world and having the compelling argument about how something sinful really isn't, I've come to say, well, maybe they have a point. There, there's, there's been other times when, be, because we're like people, we, we kind of held our tongue and we didn't say what we thought was truth and what you were saying to us. And, and we changed our behavior just because we wanted to get along with them and not be um, left behind. So, so God, the, the story of Nehemiah is very much our story too. But more than that, underneath that, more powerful than that, is this desire we have that we don't want to be just people who get on the rat race one more day and go through the methods and just go through the, uh, the motions of being people. We want to be people who are vitally connected to you and to others. We want to be people who are changing ourselves and our character and changing the destinies and the peace and uh, the sense of comfort for those around us. And God, as we do that, put us as well into the burning desire to say we can make a difference in our lives and the lives of others as we make you the measuring stick for all that we are and for all that we do. Uh, thank you that you've made your will abundantly clear to us. Now it's our responsibility to trust you enough to live that out as much as we can. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
lead us in our daily lives. When things get overwhelming, He is there. He is our provider. Let's draw close to Him now as we pray. Spirit, lead where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the water wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the water oh, wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever walk. Take us there, Lord. Take me make stronger in the presence. Oh, Spirit, lead me. Oh, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without. Oh, expand us, Lord, as we walk. Upon the water, Lord. Wherever you call us, Lord, we want to go, we want to go. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith grows stronger in the presence of my Savior. Beyond our fears, beyond our shame. Oh, take us, Lord, beyond ourselves. And I will call upon your name. I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above. All the rest in your embrace, I am yours, and you are mine. Let's sing that again. I will call, and I will call upon your name. And keep my eyes above the waves. My soul. On the way out tonight, we're going to sing the chorus to Wonderful Grace. Your grace, your grace, I thank you for your grace. <laughs> hey, let's do the intro and then jump to the chorus. Here we go. Your grace, your grace, I thank you for your grace to all my days. I thank you for your grace, oh your grace, oh your grace, I thank you for your grace for all my days. I thank you for your grace again now, oh your grace. Your grace, come on now. I thank you for your grace to all for my days. I thank you for your grace again now. Your grace, your grace. I thank you for your grace for all my days. I thank you for your grace.
say it's been great to spend the morning with you all and we just pray that uh, your grace that that will be kind of just reverberating in your ears but also your heart and your life as you go that God uh, loves to give grace he loves to give us the ability to do what we cannot do for ourselves uh, just a quick reminder that uh, if you're here in the building and you brought your uh, tithe check or contribution check you're able to make it in the little white buckets if you're not here you can send in the check you can uh, donate online through our website and we'd love to uh, to rejoice and, and give god the glory for all the ways that he continues to provide for our needs as a church god has been so good and you have been so responsive so uh, let's close in prayer then and god we bring you all of ourselves we bring you all that we have, and especially right now, we bring you our tithes and offerings and just pray that um, our lives, ourselves, our time, and our gifts will be multiplied by you as you pour your grace into them and through them to create a, a sense of hope in the world around us that they might experience what we've experienced, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity we have to live for you this week and to be uh, your flames of love and compassion and comfort in, in a world which many times is dark and confused. Make us the people that people want to be like, and may we be uh, a complete reflection of your truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.